happened to Donald Trump. His children arriving back in court today. They face grillings under oath about how they conducted themselves running this company accused of fraud. And that especially involves the period while their father was president. You see Don Jr. rising the, going up the steps there today. Eric Trump also testifying about the alleged fraud. Now, these witness executives deny playing much of a meaningful role in some of the hard parts of the company's finances. Today, some of the key clashes were over how much dodging and distance they tried to pursue while the AG's lawyers hit back with receipts, trying to expose the spin or contradictions as the judge will ultimately decide this case. Don Jr. was on the stand for the second day in a row. The lawyers tried to use his answers to show to the judge how he was responsible, they argued, for personally signing off on the alleged fraud. And when we say signing off, I could tell you today, based on what happened in court, we mean quite literally signing off because lawyers from the AG's office have his signature on these documents. Now, he deflected on what the signature itself means, not saying I didn't sign, but basically arguing that the signature was only a response to the accountants and their work, their numbers, which he trusted. Now, a key moment we want to highlight for you in our report tonight is that the judge at one point intervened directly, asking, do you have anything to do with the statements of financial condition. And here we see the deflection. Don Jr. basically saying, sure, I signed it, but no, I did not, Your Honor, actually deal with the statement. Now, let me tell you something. This tension here in this trial on this point is not unique to this case. The Trump org is accused of pushing far past the norms of business hyper-exaggeration into outright and illegal fraud. But many business cases will feature executives putting up these kind of defenses, that they are paper pushers. And it's the accountants or the lawyers and the others that they rely on to, to make these calls. Now, Don Jr. spoke after his testimony, essentially referring to that argument and saying, if you look at this logically, he says this is how business is done. You know what? I, I, I think it went uh, really well. If we were actually dealing with logic and reason, uh, the way business is conducted, but unfortunately the Attorney General has brought forth a case that is purely a political persecution. Two points there in that brief statement. One is this is how business is done. And again, the judge will be deciding whether these sound like typical legal business practices or not. The second point is what his father, defendant Trump, has been arguing really across all these cases, that any case against Trump is a political persecution, and that the reason, they argue, defendant Trump is drowning in these cases isn't because of his own conduct or the trail of evidence he left behind or all those signatures on alleged fraud that you saw today, but rather because these prosecutors, they argue, are on some kind of political mission. Now, defendants can raise questions about the government's motivation, about why a case was brought, why investigations occurred. They can ask, is there evidence of government misconduct or political targeting. They can certainly ask and raise those issues. But notice tonight where, precisely where Don Jr. raised this point today. Not in court, not with his lawyers, not with evidence. No, out of court to the press as a kind of talking point. But in these courtrooms, I can report for you tonight, Trump's lawyers have not been able to summon actual evidence to prove any prosecutorial misconduct, not in the fraud case or the others I showed you regarding Jack Smith or the DA down in Georgia. They haven't proven this against any of these officials. So that's Don Jr. And that is the second day of testimony where he says it went well and logical. Others think that basically the AG scored some points. Meanwhile, this is one of those things that, yes, some people are tired. I've mentioned some people get confused. Which Trump case are we following? But some of this is getting out into the wider culture, even in these busy times. Late night TV, obviously keeping an eye on what has finally become the reckoning. You don't see these Trump executives or Donald Trump in court that often. When he took the stand, for example, in the gag order, that was the first time he'd taken the stand in this New York trial ever. Now, as this all seeps out, here's Jimmy Kimmel's take from just last night. Don Jr. was not at Daddy Donald's last night. The prodigal son was being grilled as part of the $250 million case against their business. There he is, Tiny Soprano. I wonder what's going through his head right now. I should have worn makeup. Oh, yeah, good one. Here's the thing about Don Jr. What he lacks in intelligence, he also lacks in charisma. So, <laughs> And as with all... 
Uh, Jimmy Kimmel unloading there. You could hear some of the applause. Of course, as a legal matter, it is not the intelligence or the charisma that's on trial. It is what they did. And they have been afforded the chance to try to explain what they did. Oh, I just signed this. I just signed that. Oh, we just, we just took the numbers in. We never created the numbers. Those are claims. They're going to be tested in this trial. And it was the same for Eric Trump, who took the stand for the very first time today. As the Trump org fraud trial continued today, it focused on the Seven Springs property, which is a Trump estate in upstate New York. Now, they don't allow cameras for the testimony part in court. We only saw those, basically those visuals before people took the stand. But the younger Mr. Trump has actually reflected on this estate on camera before. This is a place that's really special to myself. It's really special to my brother, my father, really the whole family. I mean, this is really our compound. And I've spent so much of my life here. It's a special place for me and one that I'll always remember and one that I'll always be very close to. That's some footage there from the archives. And it is perfectly fine that Eric Trump thinks that property is, quote, special. The legal issue which he was tested on in court today, is how the company gave it a nearly $300 million valuation about a decade ago. It is now worth about 10% of that today, even with inflation, according to Forbes. Now, that is tough fraud evidence because unlike, say, the stock exchange, where sometimes even very pricey stocks can, the stocks can just crash, they lose most of their net worth. We've seen that happen. doesn't mean there was fraud necessarily, right? It just means you crashed. But honestly priced real estate doesn't drop by a third or two thirds, let alone 90 percent. So Eric Trump basically dealt with this today by denying that he helped create those misleading valuations. Quote, I don't think I ever saw or worked on a statement of financial condition. I don't believe I would have known about it. It's not what I did. He testified at one point. There was a bit of an angry clash and he raised his voice when pressed on this matter. There's also newly revealed deposition video we have that goes to the same defense about downplaying his role. I just don't seem to recall anything about this. Uh, you know, it's, I pour concrete, I operate properties. I don't focus on appraisals. Again, if you have one big takeaway here, it's that Eric Trump through his lawyers, has learned that one of the danger zones is appraisal. So now that's just not something he seems to know about. But the AG's lawyers pulled up some evidence. They showed, for example, an email from about a decade ago addressed to Eric Trump looking at how Seven Springs was actually valued. That receipt is right here. Quote, Eric, I'm working on your dad's annual financial statement. I need to value Seven Springs. Please find how we valued it last year. Let me know when you have time to talk. Now, over through the cross-examination today, Mr. Trump, Eric Trump, then says, well, it appears that way regarding the financial statements. It appears that's what it says, yes, when faced with this evidence that, guess what? He was discussing the valuations. Now, Eric Trump is admitting right there what he had tried to walk away from, including in that deposition. Now, he will continue testifying tomorrow, followed by his sister Ivanka and defendant Donald Trump next week. Now, there are cases out there that could land defendant Trump in prison if he were convicted. This one is not one of those cases. It's civil, as you've heard people emphasize. But Trump is clearly concerned about this fraud case. He's publicly attacked officials. He got himself a gag order. He's been talking outside of court in ways that he didn't in those other cases. And that's a big point tonight. It's partly because Trump's supposed business acumen and empire is so central to his professional PR and then political identity. It's maybe the one through line or obsession that has united all those different parts of his public life. It is the story, the AG says, a fraudulent story that powered his fame and his magazine covers and stoked more business deals and TV deals. Trump has long been obsessed with exactly what you saw on your screen there, with inflating and lying about his fortune to be on the big list, to make the Forbes list of the richest people he has now dropped from that list lately amidst these problems. So Trump is descending from business deals to watching aides cut plea deals, from the alleged fraud that helped him get on that Forbes list to now being on his own version of the most wanted list. Trump's bad karma has basically shown him to be pulling a reverse Meek Mill, the successful artist who recounted, coming up from nothing, we started on lists most wanted. But now it's the Forbes list. Echoes from feds on this beat, from informants, I think they're recording. 
Trump fell off the Forbes list. He has a case with the feds, and now he has informants in his crew, like former aide Jenna Ellis. Now, to be clear, she's testifying in a different case than the fraud trial. She is testifying in the Georgia RICO case. As for those Meek Mill lyrics, they are from a song called RICO. You can't make it up. Uh, following the fraud trial today, Nick, I did a breakdown. A lot's happened, so we've been trying to give viewers the updates each day. And the big question today seemed to be, are they involved, the executives, are they involved in the valuations or not? They certainly are. Um, there's no question that, that that has come out. You've got two, two brothers, basically, who are running the company, one who's signing off on the financials, saying they're true and accurate, but yet he's blaming the accountants and the lawyers for the falsities on those statements. And you've got the other brother who's involved in the kind of the nitty gritty of running the company who claims he didn't know anything. Um, but I think if you dig a little bit deeper here, you'll find that these defenses really don't pass the smell test. Uh, if you start with Don Jr., um, he claims that he relied exclusively on the attorneys and the lawyers. Well, first of all, we've had testimony in this case from attorneys and lawyers. We had Michael Cohen. We had other um, uh, um, accountants that testified, um, basically saying that they were instructed by Donald Trump um, to up the numbers on these various assets that appeared on the financial statements. Uh, secondly, um, Don Jr., as the executive who was signing off on these financial statements, had a certain responsibility to conduct due diligence on whether or not these numbers were valid or not. I mean, after Enron in the 2001 uh, uh, scam that occurred there, um, the government came in and basically the SEC uh, and federal law requires, uh, at least as to public companies, um, that officers, either the executive CEO or the CFO, have to sign off on the financials, basically attesting uh, to their validity and truth and that they've done due diligence to make sure that the numbers on there are fair and accurate. Now, Donald, um, even though it doesn't apply to a, a private company like Trump Organization, basically this has become the form of corporate governance that all companies have adopted. And you can see it just in the financial statements uh, that were signed by Don Jr. For example, uh, both he and Weisselberg signed off on those financial statements representing, quote, that they had evaluated the adequacy and results of the services performed, close quote, by the accountants and by the lawyers, uh, and that they, quote, accepted responsibility for the results of the services performed, close quote, by the accountants and lawyers. That means that Don Jr. had the obligation to sit down with people who were preparing these numbers and ask them very specifically, well, how did you get to the evaluation for Seven Springs? How did you get to the evaluation for my dad's apartment? Um, he had that obligation. But even worse, what the AG brought out today was that Don Jr. actually knew that there was a problem in the, evalua the valuation that was done on Donald Trump's Trump Tower apartment where he claimed that there were 30,000 square feet, when in fact there was a little bit less than 11,000 square feet. And the number claimed on that apartment was so off the wall um, that it didn't come close that the only other apartment that was sold for the most money in Trump Tower was like one-tenth of what the valuation was right. on Donald Trump's apartment. So he knew that there was a problem, and that's what the AG brought out today. But he also had an obligation to dig into all of those numbers, which obviously he did not do.